This is On Shifting Ground. I'm Ray Suarez. Everyone assumed that in a more open, interconnected world, democracy and liberal ideas would spread to the autocratic states. That's a quote from Anne Applebaum's latest book, Autocracy, Inc. But Applebaum argues that autocracy is spreading to democratic states. And the reason why is that illiberalism is good international business. Applebaum warns the seeds of autocracy have already been sown in the U.S. So how can we protect ourselves during another contentious presidential election? Anne Applebaum joins me now. She's a staff writer for The Atlantic and a Pulitzer Prize-winning historian. In addition to Autocracy, Inc., she has a new podcast, Autocracy in America. It's co-hosted by British journalist Peter Pomerantsev, and the first episode is out now. Do listen. And welcome back to On Shifting Ground. Thanks for having me. When last we spoke with you back in January, we had just started a special project with a simple question. Why are Americans feeling so bad leading into the 2024 presidential election? A lot has changed since January, admittedly. Do you think Americans are still pretty much in the same place they were this year, earlier this year? I mean, I hesitate to speak for all Americans. I do think that the nature of the Harris campaign, which really came from nowhere, but was obviously well designed and well thought through and which was deliberately intended to create some feeling of optimism and some kind of hope for the future. It's an attempt to unify people around a discussion of real issues. I think that's made a difference. I can't tell you, I can't honestly say that it's reached every American, and I doubt very much that it has, but certainly some people have something more positive to talk about. Earlier this year, you published Autocracy, Inc. It feels like the timing couldn't have been better. What's the thesis of the book? So the book argues that there is a network of dictatorships who are not united ideologically. We're talking about nationalist Russia and communist China and North Korea and Bolivarian socialist Venezuela and theocratic Iran, nations who don't share a vision of the world, they don't have the same aesthetics, they don't have the same governing system, but they do share some common interests. They have a common interest in abusing the international financial system to launder money. They have a common interest in using contemporary surveillance technology to keep track of their own citizens and maybe more. And they also have a common set of enemies. And the enemy is us. The enemy is the liberal world, the democratic world, whatever language you want to use. And that's because we talk about ideas that would hamper their particular form of absolute control. So these are all dictatorships who rule without the rule of law, without checks and balances, without independent courts, without any transparency. And the language of liberal democracy and liberalism more broadly is exactly that, that there should be, that power should be checked, that there should be legitimate opposition, that people have rights, that that ownership and money and politics should have some element of transparency in it. And so they are very bothered by that kind of language. And they, of course, push back against it inside their own countries, where very often their own political opposition uses it, but increasingly also around the world. They seek to denigrate the idea of democracy to push back, sometimes physically, sometimes militarily against the democratic world, to compete with it economically, but also, as I said, in this realm of ideas, to undermine it, to denigrate it, to create the idea that authoritarianism is stable and safe, democracy is weak and divided, partly in order to discourage their own citizens from wanting it. Looking at this association of strange bedfellows, and you sketched it out quickly in shorthand. And if we set aside Maduro in Venezuela and the mullahs of the Islamic Republic, uh, Xi Jinping, Kim Jong-un, Vladimir Putin, one thing they have in common is that they have been praised for being tough and canny and strong and strategic by one of the nominees for president of the United States. The United States is not on your list. (laughs) We don't generally have leaders who are, but where does America fit in there, in that story at this moment? So 
Donald Trump is very unpredictable because he is someone who is mostly interested in himself and his own power and his own money and maybe the money of his family or of his immediate friends. And so I can't tell you exactly what he would do if he becomes president again, because he, as I said, it will depend on what it seems to him in the moment is the most advantageous. However, I think it's safe to say that he will not want to be the leader of a grand democratic alliance that will push back against the autocratic world. He is not interested in ending kleptocracy. He is not interested in making the conversation on the internet more compatible with democracy. Uh, you know, he's possibly not even interested in um, pushing back against the autocratic world militarily and in defending Taiwan or defending Ukraine. Although I don't know that because, again, as I say, that would be decided by him in the moment, you know, in light of whatever seemed advantageous. Also, I suppose his particular form of narcissism does give him something in common with the autocratic world. I mean, he's a transactional leader. He's interested, as I say, in himself. He doesn't have a set of ideas. He doesn't have a set of values that he shares with other countries. He even seems to feel some kind of disdain for other democratic leaders. So he would certainly remove the United States as the leader of the democratic world, and that would change the world. I mean, so just before speaking to you, I was talking to a colleague in Canada whose main question was, who will lead us if Trump wins? Who's the alternative? And of course, it's not just the Canadians who are asking that. I mean, you hear that being discussed in Britain, in France, in Germany, in Poland, in Ukraine, and, you know, no doubt Australia and Japan as well. What, how will we manage this? Because people are worried. And of course, nobody talks about it, but there are plans in, in every defense ministry in Europe and probably on the planet, there are alternative plans being made for what happens if Donald Trump wins. So the idea that the United States would drop out is something people are, are well aware of and preparing for. Well, more than 40 percent of the U.S. voting population is telling pollsters they're ready to vote for a man that you warn would at least drop out of the leadership of the democratic world. And when I was in the audience at a bookstore recently where you're talking about Autocracy, Inc., it was jam packed from the store's front door to the very back, standing room only. It kind of makes it hard to generalize about where people are at and what they're worried about and, and what they think seriously could happen. I wouldn't presume to generalize about what Americans will do. And I'm amazed by the people who think they know what the outcome of the election is. I have no idea how they know or how they know how 6,000 people in Pennsylvania will vote. So it seems it's mysterious to me. I mean, I just hope that as we get closer to the election, that Americans listen carefully to what Donald Trump is saying. I mean, I want them to listen to what Kamala Harris is saying, too. But listen carefully to Trump, because Trump is saying some very extreme things of a kind that had things that haven't really been said in U.S. politics before. He's talking about if he wins, locking up his enemies, locking up, he says, election officials, he says, lawyers, he says, political consultants, whatever that means. He's talking about locking up a class of people. He, he talks about the use of violence to to push back against his enemies. He talks about use of violence to lock up immigrants, or I'm not sure whether he means legal immigrants or illegal immigrants. He's talking about creating concentration camps. You know, again, some of this is rhetoric that he's using to frighten people because when people are frightened, they do vote for autocrats. When in, in situations of war, violence, disruption, people will turn to somebody who seems like a, a strong leader or an autocratic leader as a way of feeling safe. So he's trying to create an atmosphere of violence that will make people vote for him. But it may also be that if he were to win, he would need to keep that going. And so I would pay attention to him, listen to what he's saying. Um, don't brush it aside. Don't think it's a joke because the use of that language, which is, as I said, unique in American history, we haven't had a president campaigning like that before, is a warning of what could come if he were president. Are they pages from the autocrats' playbook? Like you, I've covered politics for a long time. And when I've seen the former president speak, it's remarkable to me that I've never heard a major candidate refer to the United States as a third world country, refer to the United States as a nation in long-term decline, as a place that is sort of degraded and degrading. It's not, if you talk to political pros, the kind of language that helps win campaigns, but it does sound like the kind of thing you may warn your voters about to 
posit yourself as the solution? Uh, no, that is, of course, exactly what he's doing. And I would also say, again, this is the language that's used by Russia. It's the language that's used by China. I mean, if you were to read what Russian media says about the United States, you would hear word for word exactly what Donald Trump says. It's the language that's used by dictatorships, which, by the way, have plenty of internal problems themselves. But nevertheless, they use this language, this story about democratic decline as a way of building up their own support and their own credibility inside their own societies and also in ours. So, yes, Trump is using language of decline, disgrace in order to convince Americans to vote for someone who promises some kind of radical, revolutionary destructive change. So he and he does have which he did not have the in 2016. He does have now around him people who are thinking about what that would look like, who are talking about smashing up the US political system, smashing up the US economy, um, changing the rules, perhaps changing them in a way that would benefit um, them and their friends. I mean, so I just so that people are clear about my background, I watched something like this happen in Poland. I lived there part of the time, and I watched an autocratic populist party come to power and seek to capture the state, meaning to take over all the institutions of the state that had been independent, including the civil service, the courts, Poland has state media and others, to capture them, to put them under the control of the ruling party and to politicize them. And it, it partly succeeded, it nearly succeeded. You know, they didn't win in the end and they finally lost an election last October, but they did an enormous amount of damage to the country, to its economy, to its sense of well-being, to the functioning of its political system, maybe even to its security through doing that. And I, I fear that's what would happen in the U.S., not so much that Trump would succeed in <laughs> destroying the American state, but that in the process of trying to do so, he could do a lot of damage. I'm glad that you look so closely at the ink part of autocracy ink, if you will, that this is not just a team of political persuaders talking about abstract principles and guidance for running a state, but actually also a bunch of enterprises and businesses and the trading of information and intelligence and commodities that help cement these men in power. Let's talk about the business side of autocracy. Um, yes. So we are talking, when we speak about the autocratic world, we're very often talking about billionaires, whether it's Putin or Xi or whether their money is controlled by a family member or a friend. These are very, very rich people with secret assets that are hidden sometimes in the West, in Europe or in the United States. And they control companies that they are able to use politically. You know, this is something that I think people in the democratic world fight hard to understand. Gazprom, which is the, a Russian, private Russian gas company built on the what used to be the Soviet Ministry of Gas, is a private company whose, but whose profits go to its owners. And the owners also are, in many cases, the people who control the Russian state. And so they also use Gazprom for political reasons. So when they built the Nord Stream pipelines, the purpose of that where the Gazprom did that. The purpose of that was to create a pipeline that would go directly from Russia to Germany, avoiding Poland and Ukraine. And that was probably a preparation for the war in Ukraine. So it's a company that acts not in the economic interests of its shareholders, but also in the political interests of its shareholders who also happen to run the country. And that model of company, that kind of quasi-state company, is one you can find all over the autocratic world that has a joint political and business aspect. And I think one of the mistakes that we made in the years following, you know, the following the, uh, the 1989 in the 1990s and afterwards was imagining that there was such a thing as a business sphere that was somehow politically neutral, that we could, you know, although I should say there were many people in Russia and many people in China who also hoped that would be the case. So it wasn't just American naivete. And we didn't see the, the growth of this politicized economy, you know, and the uh, investments that were made for political reasons or for the purposes of enriching political leaders. And that world is something that we're just beginning to grapple with and understand. Partly, you're beginning to see both in the US and the UK and elsewhere, a pushback against anonymous companies, anonymous property purchases, some of the tactics and institutions that were used, the autocratic world used to hide its money. And you're beginning to see an awareness at least that trading some kinds of economic deals, particularly with China, 
have security implications. I mean, you saw this with the fuss over Huawei, whether the Chinese telecom company would be allowed to control the telecoms in democracies. And there's more awareness now of what Chinese data collection could mean for a country and for its future and so on. So they're beginning to be a pushback and understanding. But for a long time, we acted as if the economic world was completely neutral. In no short list of countries, we've got this wave of leaders in sometimes in nominal democracies, sometimes in sort of controlled and rigged democracies. But you get down to the third paragraph of a story and it mentions, oh, by the way, candidate X is also one of the richest men in the country or owns a tremendous amount of the measured GDP of a country uh, or is merely a tycoon. Silvio Berlusconi, the chocolate king of Ukraine, many around the world. This also seems to be a feature of this, where they come from outside and say, I don't have to be a thief or a, an autocrat or a dictator. I've already made my dough, so here I am to lead you. So to be fair, there have always been rich people in democratic politics. I'm not going to remember the statistics, but I mean, at the time, George Washington was a very wealthy, was very wealthy by compared to other Americans. I, I'm not sure that's new. The one thing that's very new is the phenomenon of billionaires who owe their entire success to their relationship to the state. You find this in Russia, for example, very wealthy people who are wealthy only because Putin has allowed them to become wealthy. There's certainly no, I don't know, building a better mousetrap or building yourself up from your bootstraps or whatever in that form of capitalism. The existence of the modern oligarchy Maybe there's a there was a version of it in the U.S. in the Gilded Age, but even then, at least the railroads were a real project that somebody invested in and built them rather than something fictitious. But that's a change. And those kinds of power and, the, and that kind of combined political and economic power isn't one that we're used to dealing with in the U.S. We don't think of our president, for example, being someone who not only controls the White House, but also controls Exxon, General Motors, and the Wall Street Journal, and the New York Times, and, by the way, all the judges. You know, we don't think of the of political leaders having that range of power, but in the autocratic world, they do. They control many different forms at many different institutions within the state, including economic institutions. In many cases, there is a kind of democratic despair that sets in once this syndrome reaches its, its conclusion, that this feeling that once the state segues into this form of governance, it's hard to get it back. But there are notes of optimism in your book. Uh, how does the world fight back against the hardening of this new transnational relationship in this team of autocrats? So first of all, it's important to remember that we've done things like this before. So the Gilded Age did come to an end, and we did write antitrust laws that controlled the monopolies that dominated the U.S. economy at the end of the 19th century. So it's not as if we haven't had this, this kind of problem in the past. You know, secondly, I believe that there are coalitions to be made that haven't been made yet. You know, the coalition to end kleptocracy, there's beginning to be political momentum. I mean, you have it actually in the UK. The new leader of the Labour Party is former human rights lawyer. The new British foreign secretary is somebody who's talked about kleptocracy on the campaign trail. You're beginning to see a move as po political leaders understand the ways in which enabling of kleptocracy damages us and begins to damage our own politics. So I think that's beginning to change. You can imagine a positive role in the future for, a, you know, as I said, broad coalitions working together with the democratic world and maybe with the activists from the autocratic world. I mean, almost everything I know about kleptocracy comes from the Russians who were studying it in their own system, who knew exactly how it worked who understood perfectly well what the Western role in laundering Russian money was and who were able to explain it and better than anybody else. I mean, the late Alexei Navalny, his great gift was being able to make short films describing the workings of the kleptocratic system that were then watched by hundreds of millions of people. So I see the possibility for a political movement out there. I'm just I, I'm, I'm hoping that people begin to understand the urgency of these changes. At the same time. Viktor Orban is the acting president of the EU. France, by a whisker, saw off Le Penism. 
Geert Wilders, his party was the number one vote getter in the Netherlands. It's kind of a a mixed bag as you look across the world. First of all, I mean, Orban is the acting head of the EU only for a few more months. That's a rotating job, and it, it's actually fairly meaningless. It means that you get to host meetings in your country, and actually, in this case, he's being boycotted. He's not even holding those meetings, so it's not clear what that means. I mean, look, what happened in France was that the political center and the political left joined together, you know, created a coalition to block the far right. What happened in the UK was something very similar. You know, when people become really aware of the danger, they're sometimes willing to create coalitions across old lines and win elections. I'm hoping Americans can see that too. It's not just Democrats who and the, the left who should be voting for Harris. It's centrist and, and even the center right. I mean, Dick Cheney's voting for her. Liz Cheney's voting for her. There's a series of Republicans who said they would. So in the face of this kind of challenge, we might need new coalitions. We might need new friends. We might need to rearrange somewhat the lines upon which we fought before. I mean, we can go on arguing about tax rates, you know, after Trump is gone. But first, we should defeat him. We're in mid-September. The war in Ukraine looks to be settling in for a very long and lethal haul. Uh, we're approaching the first anniversary of the October 7th Hamas attack in Israel. China and North Korea and their relationship to Russia and Ukraine are still sort of being filled in with cross-hatching as we try to understand what's going on there. And who knows what list of world leaders are looking forward to a Trump victory in November. Where are we at right now? I mean, from everything you've said, it's way, way too early to relax and feel like, ah, we got this thing. But at the same time, there are certainly no shortage of disturbing signs. There is no arc of history, neither one that bends towards justice nor that bends towards disaster. There's nothing inevitable about history at all. What happens tomorrow is completely dependent on what we do today. And crises can be dealt with. And it's in, in a certain sense, it's never too late. I mean, there's oh, something will always change. I mean, you have in each one of those dictatorships that you've described, there are, there are deep weaknesses. There are pitfalls. You know, the Chinese economy is much slower than it's meant to be. Investment in China has dropped, actually, not least because people are afraid of the geopolitical risk. The Russian economy is teetering. There's a lot of ill, bad feeling in Russia. We're talking in a moment when Ukrainians have occupied a part of Russia, the first time Russia has been invaded since the Second World War, and the Russian army has not been able to push them out, nor has it been able to push move forward very far in Donetsk. The Ukrainians actually control more territory in Russia than the Russians have managed to take in the last six months of fighting and, and losing thousands and thousands of people. So in each one of those situations, there are positive stories too. Uh, you know, it's a question of how we frame it, how we think about it, and how we apply our ability and our talents to, as the democratic world to push back. Back in June, writing in The Atlantic, you argued that Russia and China are winning the propaganda war with their influence in the Republican Party. What do you make of what's going on there? This was the most staunchly anti-communist of our two governing parties. It had fellow travelers, if I can use that term, who were even more hard right and anti-communist than the mainstream Republican Party. What's going on now? Uh, so the piece in The Atlantic was actually an excerpt from the book that des 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 description is made in the book. And of course, we're speaking a few days after an FBI indictment of a group of YouTubers and influencers in Tennessee who were taking really quite a lot of money funneled to them via Russia Today, as well as they've also revealed some other efforts that the Russians have made to influence our campaign. All of those influ attempts to influence are successful because there's a constituency for it, because you're right, there's a part now of the Republican Party that has been captured by autocratic propaganda. Again, the belief that the U.S. is dying and failing, either thanks to wokeness or thanks to immigration, the belief that the answer to that is some kind of strongman or some kind of revolution or some kind of bloody coup. I mean, these are ideas that you find in a part of the Republican Party and you find them coming from the autocratic world as well. I don't believe that all Republicans believe this, and I don't think it's, a, it's necessarily a feature 
of that party alone, you can find a lot of apocalyptic thinking on the far left as well. But it is true that it's taken hold in the party, I think mostly thanks to Trump, who's been using that language for the last eight years and whose family and acolytes have taken over the party. And the party has also turned out to be filled with extraordinarily weak and unprincipled people who are not willing to push back against it. It will be one of the political changes most studied by future historians, I'm sure. It's a remarkable moment that one of our great political parties with a long tradition of being interested in democracy and freedom, you know, dating back to the time when it was quite a different party and during the Civil War, that it would be captured by autocratic propaganda is quite amazing, but it is nevertheless true. Is it a side effect of a kind of complacency and comfort now that we're a full generation and more out from the fall of the Berlin Wall? The people who were adults then are becoming a smaller influence in our politics. With no Soviet Union, did we sort of get a little lazy about this? Maybe. Actually, in my previous book, In Twilight of Democracy, I wrote a little bit about this. And one of my other thoughts was that, you know, there were people who liked the Cold War because they liked feeling like they were at the edge of an ideological conflict. And people on the right in enjoyed that debate. And once it was over, they didn't want to turn to the business of building roads or fixing the healthcare system. They wanted to continue the ideological debate. Let's talk a little bit about the new podcast, Autocracy in America. In it, you make the case that there are authoritarian tactics already at work in the United States. What should people be looking out for? Are people ready? Do we know if they're ready to hear that case being made? So the inspiration for this podcast was somewhat as we've been doing this conversation, a lot of the talk about Trump and what, what happens if he wins a second time, a lot of it is there's this apocalyptic thing, you know, dictatorship will come to America. And then people immediately start thinking about Nazis because that's our image of dictatorship. But both my colleague, Peter Pomerantz, who made this and I, we've both lived in places where there has been an assault on democracy, but it doesn't look like that. There aren't thugs in the street. Instead, it's much more subtle. And some of that you can already see in the United States. So you can already see the tactics of intimidation working, for example, inside the Republican Party to silence people who have different views. You can see the misuse of courts and this kind of performative use of lawsuits. It's not even about the justice becoming politicized. And we've, we have, we've always actually had a bit of that in our history. And we, of course, we have it now with so-called you know, right-wing judges and left-wing judges and so on. But there's something even more insidious going on, which is also the use of courts as a kind of political performance. And we described that in episode two. So some of the things that look to us like democratic decline are already here. And the point of the podcast is to try to describe them in a way that makes people understand them. For me, it's a very different kind of project, actually. I mean, it's a storytelling, really, rather than banging people over the head with facts. Not that I bang people over the head with facts. <laughs> my, I always try and tell stories, even in my history books and so on. But it's told through interviews and through conversations between Peter and I. And as I said, Peter lived for many years in Russia. During the early Putin years, I lived in Poland during a period when we had a political party trying to alter democracy there. We've both traveled a lot in the autocratic world. We're making comparisons that we hope will make Americans think twice. Before we go, should Americans be careful? Should they listen uh, to what one of our governing parties is saying about whether or not they'll accept the results of the November election? So the attack on the electoral system is in its way one of the worst things that Trump has done. Making Americans not believe in the voting system, which by the way, there's no evidence whatsoever that in 2020 it was corrupted. On the contrary, dozens and dozens of lawsuits and recounts and so on proved that was not the case. Trump even sometimes now almost admits it himself. But making Americans not believe in the electoral system is almost a pure invitation to violence because it means that whatever is the result, it will be questioned and there could be difficulties in the transfer of power either way. It's terribly damaging to people's faith in our political system and into the possibility of peaceful transfer of power. Ann Applebaum writes for The Atlantic. 
Her latest book is called Autocracy, Inc. Her new podcast, Autocracy in America. Good to talk to you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. You've been listening to On Shifting Ground, produced in partnership with KQED, with funding from listeners like you. Today's episode was produced, mixed, and mastered by Matteo Schimpf. Additional production and engineering were provided by Rob Spate. KQED's Jim Bennett is our technical supervisor. Jared Sport is our executive producer. Philip Yun is co-CEO of Commonwealth Club World Affairs. Our music is from Blue Dot Sessions. I'm Ray Suarez. Thanks for listening.